and welcome back to the Beer Ladies podcast. Uh, my name is Katie. Um, in this episode, we are going to be talking about water. Water, water everywhere and lots of it to drink and lots of it to make beer. Um, so uh, sit back and relax and join me and my co-host, Tandy, <laughs> and our special guest, Chelsea, who is a water engineer. Hey, Chelsea. Um, before uh, we go to what are we drinking, I am going to say, please check us out on all the social medias, um, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram, uh, anywhere you get your podcasts. We are at Beer Ladies Pod everywhere, I think, at this stage. Um, and you can also, if you would like to donate to our beautiful cause of uh, keeping us in podcast equipment, of course, we would never spend it on beer, would we? You can buy us a coffee um, at buy us a coffee forward slash Beer Ladies Pod. Beer Ladies well, Podcast, I think. Beer Ladies Podcast. There we go, Tandy. So <laughs> all the good stuff out like subscribe share tell your friends about us okay because we're amazing why That's wouldn't true. you why wouldn't you okay so i'm going to start with what are you drinking and seeing as chelsea is our guest i'm going to start with our guest chelsea what are you drinking so i'm drinking the kenegar yanar adi yanar <laughs> porter it's a porter i know that <laughs> i really uh, like it's this lovely one. Yeah, I'm still in the like warm wet or cold weather. Like oh, I need something cozy. So, and if you just show us on YouTube, you our oh, the head is gone. When you poured yeah. that earlier, it was it looked perfect. I know. I I've been working on my pour. So very good, very good. It's a noble cause. And Tandy, <laughs> tell us what are you drinking? Right. Oh, so I went I went on the hunt for a Pilsner Urquell because. I really wanted one, but also it's really relevant to what we're going to be talking about today. But I couldn't find one, unfortunately. So I've got, I've got its, uh, I've got its step cousin, the Staro Pramen, which is also a Czech Pilsner. Um, and I'm, hey, I'm very happy with it, um, and I love a Pils, so I'm pretty cool. But it was important that I got a Czech Pils today, and it's because the water is quite important in brewing a Pilsner. So, Katie, what have you got? Well, I might have gotten a pill. I haven't got a Czech Pilsner. I have a German Pilsner, uh, which is, ooh, can we see this? It's a Eucarious Pils. And uh, if you have been listening to the Snugcast podcast, this is was their beer of the year, I think, for 2020. Hey, lads at the Snug. Hey, Snugcast. Snugcast. Snugpast. What was I talking about? So <laughs> I was ordering some... Uh, alcohol online and I just saw it on the uh, online shop and I was like because I, I haven't seen it in shops or anything so I was like oh I'm gonna try that and I'm gonna drink my uh my pills now and it's you know lovely light and golden and how's it going for you is it delicious it's oh, it's delicious Brilliant. it's the first pint of the day as well oh. you know after work you, the evening you just sit down and you just want to relax so is there any better feeling than that oh, I know <laughs> I know so we have a special guest with us and she is a, a longtime friend of friend of us anyway and now she's finally on the pod so friend of the pod Chelsea do you want to tell us a little bit about who you are what you do how you like yeah. beer go <laughs> on start say hi yeah sounds good hi everybody um yeah so I love beer um I am from the states originally I now live in Dublin um, and I started off the, the craft beer scene in Arizona is amazing. So I've always been interested. And then when I moved here, I was like, I need a new hobby. So I started brewing and that's how I found you guys. So that Yay. was a fun start to that. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I, I'm also a water engineer. So, um, that's, uh, I, I'm a chemical engineer by training and I ended up in water because, um, I just really care about water. Like I'm, uh, I'm Native American. My tribe is Navajo or Diné. Um, hi, Diné, if you're watching. Um, and uh, it's actually funny because my my uh, clan is uh, Totochini, which means bitter water clan. So like everybody always kind of jokes that I was meant for this this uh, this uh, pathway because you know of my That's clan. That's so cool. So, yeah. <laughs> So not the real reason I got into it, but I think it, it kind of speaks to it because like when I was growing up, like my grandmother didn't have running water. So, you know, they'd have to truck water in um, from a well in town and like 
all of that kind of stuff. I, one of my fond memories of siphoning water out of a barrel, helping my grandmother and she was laughing at me because I couldn't do it. <laughs> so yeah, I know uh, that's, that's me. I, I, I'm a typical water process engineer in Dublin. And I'd say your grandmother is shocked now or was shocked at the waste of like, you can just turn on a tap and it goes down the sink and it's like, Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. She got running water. Gosh, like maybe like, 10 to 15 years ago, I want to say. Um, and it, it like, she was like, this is really weird. She didn't use it for the first, like, you know, for, for the first bit she had it. She was like, this is just too strange. But she got used to it after a while. I mean, that is very recent. You know, can you imagine? I mean, we, we've all been alive for a fair amount longer than 15 years ago. And I mean, running water is something that's been around for like decades probably hundreds of years by this stage really oh yeah in, in a lot yeah. of cities yeah i mean yeah. water treatment really took off in 1920 so um very hmm. yeah so and that's when all the distribution systems that's why like a lot of the aging infrastructure and everything you hear about that's why is because it's almost 100 it's like 100 years old by now so wow. at least the oldest stuff so, so from your from your uh, native american tribe though what does bitter water mean um, it refers to kind of the area. So that's actually one of the, the original, um, one of the original uh, clans. So it refers to a certain area that they originated from. So yeah, cool. it's just like that's the direct translation. So, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. And it's cool that, that uh, you picked up brewing. And I think that, look, on we've we've been doing this series on the podcast of you know different ingredients you know the four main ingredients of beer are water malt um, hops and yeast and we've circled back finally to water and guys i want to tell you that there is actually a reason that we left water for last it's because it's the fucking scariest ingredient okay of all of them it's the scariest it is also the one that makes up like 90 percent of your beer so it is generally really really important for your brew but there's quite a lot to say about water and what i wanted to maybe introduce the concept or how i wanted to introduce this concept is that when you start home brewing you generally go through it's kind of a predictable pattern which is really interesting you generally kind of start with a kit beer which is where you just kind of mixing syrup water you know the syrup is just a very concentrated malt extract with water and then it ferments and then you bottle it and then you drink it a couple of weeks later, you know, all the things. Now, that's that's step one. And step two is when you go to an all grain system, whether it's something like a grain father or whether it's a three-step system, um, like people use old kegs for that or they use cooler boxes or brew in a bag on a stove. You know, there's lots of different ways, but moving to a system where you're controlling your ingredients is the second step. And normally that's when people start to control the amount of um, grains, so their, their malts and their hops, um, and control their yeast, because normally in a kit you get the yeast with it and it's generally dodgy anyway. So anyway, so after you move from kit beers or extract brewing into all grain, you, you tend to start becoming a little bit more invested in the quality of your beer. Now, your beer can be excellent from a kit. It can be excellent from a very basic all-grain setup. But there's generally a couple of things that you'll look at if you're trying to make your beer better. One of them is temperature control. Because as we've mentioned in our yeast episode, uh, last season probably, so just go back and listen to it, um, different yeasts like different temperatures. So, for instance, uh, quike, quike yeast likes really high temperatures, whereas lager yeast likes really low temperatures. So, Investing in temperature control gives you consistent um, temperature throughout your fermentation and your conditioning, and that gives you good beer. The other thing that people tend to look at when they're really making their beer better is their grains and their malt. So they look at the crush, like the crush size of their, of their grains, because if you can control the crush size, you can control any potential astringency, you can control like the enzymatic process that comes from your grain. There's a bunch of stuff that you can do there. Now, to be honest, I'm not at that point of, of home brewing yet. But the thing that a lot of people spend a lot of time learning about is water. Um, because you can, if you can control your temperature, your yeast health, your grain crush, your hop freshness, you know, all of those things, the only thing left to control is water. And water is, it's, it's kind of scary for me because I'm just not a 
chemist by any stretch of the imagination. You know, I'm, I'm so much more of a, you know, add a dash of this and a dollop of that kind of person. And that's very like anti-methodical brewing practices. But water makes a really, really big difference to the quality of your beer. One of the common things that we have, let's say here in Dublin, is that hoppy beer is you just often lose the flavor of hops. Like you can do what you want. You can, you know, you can treat your water uh, to, to the nth degree and somehow the hop flavor just doesn't stay. Like your bitterness doesn't quite stay. Your, the freshness of the hops doesn't stick around. Whereas in some parts of the world, they really struggle with darker beers like stouts and porters. And that comes down to the water content. So I'm sure Ch Chelsea, you're going to chime in a whole bunch about like why, you know, what makes up different kinds of water. But I wanted to maybe just set a bit of context in that the way that beer styles developed across the world is 100% linked to the kind of water that was present in these locations. So when we talk about really um, prominent styles, if we talk about um, English pale ales and even to an extent IPAs, because I mean, you know, that's kind of where they come from. We're really talking about a water profile that is famous for being in Burton-on-Trent, which is where the pale ales came from. And that kind of water is high in sulfates. Um, and God forbid, I don't know what that means. Chelsea's going to tell us. But it means yeah. that it's good for bitter, dry beers. So if you're looking to do a pale ale or an IPA, you know, you're looking for that slightly higher mineral sulfate content. It, it must do something to the flavors to make it seem more sharp and dry. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we've got exactly where we are here in Dublin. We've got very low sulfates in our water, but we've got high carbonates and lots of calcium, I think. Um, and what that does is it accentuates the characters of malt. So all of your rich chocolatey coffee flavors that come from the malt, that is like naturally accentuated with the water that we're in. But there's other, there's other famous water profiles. So one is in Dortmund in Germany, and it's not famous for being high in one thing or another thing. It's famous for being very balanced. And that's interesting to me because a lot of the German beers are just very well balanced. Whether it's a lager or a pilsner or whether it's a, a vice, um, they, they, they just seem to have it you know, nailed and dialed in, um, which is cool to me. I think that's really fascinating. And then arguably, maybe the famous or, or second most famous um, water profile is in Pilsen, which is in the Czech Republic. So that's why Katie and I both have Pilsners. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in the Czech Republic, in Pilsen, in, in the region of Pilsen, it's very low ions, it's very soft water. And I don't know why, but that seems to be really good for Pilsners. So I guess it doesn't accentuate the malt too much. It doesn't accentuate the hops too much. It allows, I don't know what it does. Chelsea, maybe you can weigh in on what all these things mean. But yeah. Yeah, those those are the sort of famous water profiles, and that's why we have these very distinct styles. And as you know, as home brewers, a lot of people try and replicate these water profiles when they're making different styled beers, because you know, arguably that'll give you the best chance of replicating or um, or getting that flavor profile exactly right. So before we get to a, what is a fav, uh, water profile. Mm. And, and how does your water profile match with your flavor profile? So you were talking, Tandy, about soft water and hard water and sulfates and calcium. So Chelsea, what are they? Tell us oh. about water. Oh, you're right up my alley there. Um, yeah, so um, I can start with the, the hardness, um, the hardness uh, versus soft water. So hardness basically means how much calcium and magnesium do you have in your water? And there's also other constituents, but they're less common and I, I wouldn't worry about them. Calcium and, and magnesium are the, the main drivers there. So um, just because you have hard water doesn't mean you're going to know how much calcium and magnesium because it's all down to what your source is. So, you know, each water treatment plant that you get your water from is going to have a different source. So whether it's groundwater, whether it's a river, a canal, um, a lake, every single source of water has something different. And even between them, so even one river won't be the same because there's different geographies where it's being pulled from. So water is one of those things like you're never going to get the same water profile in one spot. Um, so um, yeah, so basically the, the hardness is the magnesium and the calcium and the calcium is known to um, actually 
Um, and you were mentioning that in Dublin, you were saying that people had issues with keeping their hops together. Yeah. So that actually kind of tells me maybe the hardness from Dublin water is from magnesium because calcium actually is supposed to bring out the hoppiness in your beer. So mm-hmm. that kind of tells me, and I, I will preface this with, I am new to brewing. I'm only a couple of years in, so I'm still learning. Um, I'm just using my, you know, chemistry background to, to, to talk on this stuff. So as much as you want to jump in, Tandy, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've been learning so much from your guys' podcast. So. so it's interesting that you mentioned sort of calcium and magnesium and, uh, now we we had um i'd asked a, 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 you know a friend within the brewing community who tends to know a lot about water and chelsea you were around for this but i'd asked for like what is the what is the thing that that if you are a complete noob to brewing but you want to make your water better like what is the thing that you should be doing and he was like right make sure that there's no chlorine so that means adding a camden tablet which i don't even know what's in a camden tablet or boiling your water for at least 10 minutes like rolling boil to get rid of any chlorines because chlorine gives you chlorophenols and that is really not good for your beer. Yeah. That's so that's number one. Number two, he was saying that there's kind of two main, let's say, additions that you could make to your beer. And if you want it to be um if you want it to be really scientific about it, I mean this is this is not for you. But he was saying that every beer needs calcium like in this and especially within the sort of dublin and irish water scene you need calcium so it doesn't matter what you bring add calcium in yeah. some or other form it could be like a teaspoon of calcium chloride into your mash water or into your um, yeah into your you know your, your strike water and that's probably enough you know you don't have to be even too scientific about it if you want to be super basic but add some kind of calcium to your water because and that and and Chelsea so like that's that's what made me think though is that you know we clearly maybe we don't have a lot of it here and adding that helps to like bring out the dryness and the sharpness or the fruitiness I guess of some hops and that makes sense yeah it does because especially because the charge um so the electrical charge on the calcium atom wants to grab things like it really wants to cling to stuff so it might cling things together to make those aromatics or make those tastes form in in the beer so that makes sense i mean scientifically (laughs) so um yeah yeah so that was i thought that was quite interesting and i remember that conversation as well um like dechlorination using the candom tablets like that's done in water treatment plants it's basically a coagulant or mm. a, a dechlorination agent where it just kind of blinds to the to the chlorine and doesn't allow the chlorine to bind to anything else, creating bad, as you, I can't remember what you called it, but the, those properties that make the bad taste, it, it, it binds to it before it can, has the chance to. And then yeah. it settles out in your, in your, um, your waste stream. So there that makes go. a lot of sense. Another yeah. thing, if you have like a GAC, um uh so granular activated carbon filter in your your house uh, uh, sometimes those like are a, paired a brita yes yeah exactly okay. so if you have a brita filter that will dechlorinate as well so, gotcha ah, yeah but okay. obviously <laughs> pouring that much water through a build brita filter would be quite a lot of time so that would be um, it's only if you have thing. it like i know in Ari- like in arizona you would have like a gac like tank that like all your water flows through so oh, and that's gotcha. to get rid of like tastes and odors and stuff because that's what water treatment plants use them for among and other things i have heard people um having like under tap systems you know like in the kitchen to to get all of your water through one of those and yeah. apparently they're very good and i think they are quite popular with brewers as well because look a lot of home brewers like to treat their water in whatever way um, and chelsea you can tell us about reverse osmosis in a minute but you know just basically filtering your water is probably step one, you know, even if you don't want to do anything else, like a basic filtering of your water is a good thing. Um, I would, I would say, and I'm not an expert, but I would say if you wanted to buy bottled water for your brewing, just be mindful of the the mineral contents and stuff, because it is going to be so different to your tap water. Um, And, and somebody once told me, can't remember who, can't remember how, but somebody once told me, if you like the taste of your water, you'll likely like the taste of your beer. So if, okay. you, if you're one that that has to filter their tap water in order to drink it, you're not going to like beer made with your tap water. So, you know, that's, a, that's a, a bit of a yardstick, you know, that you could use. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that definitely makes sense because I've I've been involved in um, outreach programs about you know drinking tap water because I come from a bit arid region where you know paying three ta- three thousand times markup for a bottle of water versus tap just doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, but uh, they they actually found like where you grew up is usually the type of water you prefer. So like suppose- if you move and to a different area that like has a different tasting water, you'll probably say, oh, that tastes horrible. And then somebody else says, oh, no, I actually like it. So this isn't like a right or wrong thing. It's all about your mm. own taste buds. So yeah. it's about how your palate is has developed yeah. and, and over time. And if you grow up with very hard water that's high in magnesium, you're going to like that taste. Whereas if you go to so magnesium and calcium are positively charged. So would sulfates be soft water? If you go to um, or no. are they... No, sulfates are their own little beast, I think. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So so I don't know if this helps, but the the prevailing advice, I mean, this is at its most basic form, but if you're going for a softer beer, so think about a stout or think about like maybe a New England IPA, you know, like really juicy, really like full in the mouth, you know, those kinds of soft beers. Adding calcium chloride is apparently the way to do it. Um, because you're going for a softer beer, but for harder beers, so an IPA, a dry saison, you know, drier beers, you'd do calcium sulfate. So calcium is in both, and then just the other one kind of varies, and I don't know what chloride means anyway, but we'll get to it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I know, like chlor- chloride is, is, is like a sodium. So if you think about um, uh, table salt, it's sodium chloride. Yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah, and yeah. Salt, so salt that, softens water, right? So like bicarb softens water. So that makes sense. Exactly. So like like if you've ever heard of using ion exchange, like that's what that's what ion exchange does. And I can oh. talk about that in a bit because the the industrial breweries use that on occasion. And that's basically saying, okay, I have this type of ion hardness, and I want to exchange it for a softer type of ion. So you do the salt cha- trade basically. Um, to, to get a different type of water, basically. Um, so, yeah, because, like, I think I've read that, like, chlorine and chlorides, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, um, they make the beer a bit fuller and sweeter. So um, that, that's that's what I read in my research, anyway. <laughs> um, I have not gotten to the point where I'm changing my water. I, I'm still very new to brewing and just trying to figure out how to brew first. Um, yeah. But, yeah. And then another factor in water is also pH. So, yeah. so what is so all, all I know is like it can be like acidic or basic. And, and apart from that, I don't know. One turns litmus paper blue, one turns it red. If I, you know, yeah, what, what, <laughs> go on. So, what's what's pH? Yeah. So, pH is um, basic, like the, the, the most basic way I could say it is the amount of free ions that can attach to things. So if you think about the brewing process, it's a microbiology process, right? You've got yeast, you've got bugs, and they're doing the dirty and they're making beer, right? So the more the more you have, the better it is. But there are certain strains of those microbiology that like a certain type of pH. So there's certain types of biology that prefer a lower pH, and there's certain types of biology that prefer a higher pH. Um, I am actually researching this right now as far as brewing is concerned um, because as I understand there's different different styles of brew prefer different types of pH so when we were talking about the the temperature control one of my comments was it would be just as easy to get a um, a pH control so so having the pH control because those probes come all in one if you have a pH controller it measures temperature so if you have that, you can actually watch the, the, the pH throughout your brewing process and make sure that you're hitting that optimal, that optimal um, pH for the type of beer you're making. That's really so, cool. Yeah, now, yeah. I mean, and, I know that, uh, you know, again, I'm also not an expert and I've been brewing for a few years, but I'm, you know, I'm too... I'm, I'm, I'm too all over the place to care about all the things at the same time. But okay. people often do say, you know, once you've mashed your grains in, you know, once you've added your grains to your water and they've been in them for, you know, a, a good few minutes to like really soak up, you should take a sample of your, of your mash and cool it down to room temperature and then do a pH test, you know, do a test. And what you're looking for may depend on the beer style you're after, but 
generally you're looking for between 5.2 and 5.6. So you're looking for a slightly acid um, composition, um, which was interesting to me because I, you know, it doesn't seem like beer is too acidic, but yeah. Um, but that's what you're looking for. And I think that um, if it goes too low or too high, you know, you, you might have adverse reactions with your yeast. You know, you might have adverse like tastes, like there's a bunch of stuff. And things like the size of the grain and all of that can affect the pH. So, you know, it, it, everything affects everything, which is why water is so cool and scary. So yes. if you found that your pH was, was, was out, just say you were doing that and it was, it was showing up slightly, slightly alkaline at around an eight. And you're like, what can you do to make it come down to a five? What do you do? The, some, the, yeah. No, oh, no, go it. ahead. You're the brewer. <laughs> oh, no, honestly. No, but some, some people have things like lactic acid or something on hand um, to, bring it, to bring it back down. Um, but, you know, I've tested my pH a couple of times, uh, but I, it's never been out of range. Okay. Maybe I don't do anything crazy, but it's really not been an issue. So I think it's one of those things, like if you're – if, if you're, you know, a commercial brewery and you're trying to hit that, that that same, you know, style every single time, that might be a really important metric or KPI for you. But I think yeah. in a home brewery, you, you're kind of okay. Like, Yeah. And to be honest, like um, pH, it will keep you consistent because it's all about like, like, as I said, it's about the amount of ions that are available to attach to things. So if you're using the correct grain bill and you're using the correct amount of items, you're, you're always going to produce, unless your water changes drastically, which does happen. Like there are reasons that could happen. Like there are certain treatment plants that parts of the year they use river water, parts of the year they use groundwater. So that might change and that, mm. you know, you'd, you'd have to manage. But for the most part, if you're using the same water source and you're using a, a dedicated grain bill, this isn't going to be like, it's not going to make your beer horrible, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and actually that reminded me, I wanted to touch a bit on alkalinity um, because I know that was a question somebody asked me ages ago and I went away and figured it out and forgot to get back. So I'm going to get back now. Um, so basically- So whoever that was that asked Chelsea <laughs> that question all those years ago or months ago. Best to be listening. <laughs> oh, like time has just gone on, on hold with all the lockdowns and stuff. Oh, so yeah. listen now, Chelsea's got her answer. Go on, yes. sorry to put in there. <laughs> no, you're grand. Yeah, so basically alkalinity is, um, if you think about it, it's, it's the amount of acid that's required to drop your pH where you want it, right? So yes, you could go out and get a water quality test or whatever, but really what is the question you're asking? You're asking where, how, how much acid do I need to add to get to my pH? So that's really all you need to do practically um, is do a, do a test, like add like small bits of acid little by little. And then you'll always know for your type of water, you need X amount of acid to, to, to drop your pH to your target. And obviously this is somebody that cares about the target pH. Like, like Candy said, if, if you're happy with your beer, go with your beer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, does that make sense, Tandy? Yeah. That's the it, simplest no, way I can put it without it getting does. into chemistry. <laughs> it, no, it does. And you know what? I think, you know, for the, this is, this is, um, water 101, right? So this is our intro to water as a really important brewing ingredient. And I don't want for anybody to go away from this thinking, oh, shit, I can't brew. It's too complicated. No, absolutely you can brew because people even back in the ages didn't treat their water. They just adjusted their styles to what they had. Now, I mean, with the power of the internet and the power of freaking delivery services everywhere, we've got so much control over everything that you could brew to your water if that's what works for you, or you could change your water. And you know what's really popular? It's an expensive option, but what's really popular is reverse osmosis, which basically strips everything from the water so that you've got like nothing in it, no minerals, no ions, no, I mean, Chelsea, feel free <laughs> to jump in, yeah. but you've got nothing. You've got like literally base H H2O water. I don't know what that means, but then, then what brewers do is that they add in salts and you know, all of the different things to get to their desired profile. Now, for me, that's pretty advanced. Um, it's not it's not an everyday thing, and it's certainly not a hobby brewer's thing unless you're very, very invested. Um, and, uh, you know, it's also um, very 
wasteful of water, which is another topic that I think we should talk about. Yeah. Go ahead, Katie. Oh, no, no. Yeah, yeah, completely. So I've been reading up on water sustainability and the average for just say we're going to create a bottle of beer. So on average, you need seven bottles of beer to make that one bottle of beer, according to mm -hmm. 2018 data from the, what I was reading. And I know that um, breweries, especially in the region of the world, Chelsea, where you are from, because they are living in such arid conditions and there isn't a supply of water. A lot of the breweries, we'll say in Arizona and, and California, that region of the world, have a lot of initiatives to try and reduce that ratio. So I don't know if that ratio has a, has a term. I'm going to call it the water ratio. Hey. <laughs> I could call it the You're very ratio. close, actually. Oh, what? <laughs> very close. It's a water to beer ratio. They've been really, really um, creative with that one. Oh, wow. <laughs> I would never have guessed that. I, gen I genuinely didn't even know that was a thing. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so apparently in the industrial beer world, that is a big number. Um, it also ties to water use efficiency, which um, I deal with every day. I'm, I'm a process engineer, so every process that requires water um, pretty much calculates the water use efficiency. And it's really simple calculation. How much water do you use to produce whatever you're making? So, um, yeah, so th those are the two terms that the industrial guys use. Uh, so water to beer ratio, which is the easy thing of understanding, seven liters of water to one liter of beer or whatever metric system you want to use. Or gallons. Yeah. Or yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> what, imperial system even, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I've been converted yeah. to the metric. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I made it over. Our work here is done. Tom. Done. <laughs> yeah. We can retire. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, to touch on your point. So um um, and this kind of goes into to, uh, the treatment. So I might back up a bit and just go through the treatment that is typically used in a brewery and then touch on to the sustainability and recycling that's being done um, really all over the world. It's not just in that area, but I, I know that area well because that's where I'm from. So what do industrial breweries use to treat? Um, I, I, I think typically back in the day, um, and I say back in the day, I mean like, 20 years ago um it would be a lot of filtration <laughs> like you know your typical sand filtration um uh maybe some of that granular activated carbon that i was talking about to kind of get rid of those odors and stuff but then they they noticed like especially with water scarcity and um when i say water scarcity i actually mean water quality scarcity because we have the same amount of water on earth as we did billions of years ago it's more that it's concentrated over time and it's just not drinkable so we have to do something to treat it, right? That is so, so interesting. I have that never is heard yeah, that. Yeah, little factoid there. I will qualify for all of the meteors that have dropped on the earth that adds a bit of water. So anybody that's fact checking me there, there's that bit. But for the most part, yeah, all the water that's on earth now was there billions of years ago. The dinosaurs were drinking it and um, everything is recycled water. So sorry if you didn't want to know that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um so yeah so so over time they they realized that you know the water that they were getting wasn't being consistently clean so they needed to come up with more and more technology and it's actually quite interesting that it was actually these types of processes that pushed the water treatment um innovation so like moving into ultra filtration and micro filtration where it's uh, just basically a plastic filter that has really tiny holes. So like micron size holes. So like the size of like your hair. Um, and so, um, and then as time goes on, they realize not nah, we need something better because, you know, that might remove all of your, you know, microbiology and stuff. But all of these things that are coming up, like, um, you know, calcium, hardness, sulfates, all the things we've been talking about. Um, is not removed by those things. So that's where kind of reverse osmosis, which Tandy, you touched on a couple of times. Mm -hmm. So that's actually using a woven filter. So instead of being like a plastic one that has a defined size for the, the hole that the water can get through, it's actually a woven filter and um, it flexes. So everybody has clothes. And if you push on, pull on your clothes, you can see the holes get bigger. So it's just like that. And um, the reverse osmosis technology uses pressure across those membranes. And it actually kind of does this, um, it, it's um, 
it, it, it's an osmotic pressure. That's the scientific term for it. But it, all it really means is if there's a high concentration on one side, the ions want to jump to the other side uh, mm, because okay. of the pressure that you put it on, put on it. So that means that all of your um, all of your hardness, all of your calcium, magnesium, sulfates, anything that has a positive or negative charge wants to jump to the other side of the membrane. And then if you push in enough pressure through it, then eventually you get, you know, pure water. Um, what does that actually mean? Yeah. What is pure water anyway? Basically, pure water has next to zero alkalinity. So that means if you put one drop of water into it, your pH is going to move. You know, I, if for anybody that's ever try, played with pH, you know, sometimes you're sitting there with the dropper being like, when is this going to actually change my pH? That is not going to be the case if you've done a hunt, like treated it really well with RO. So that's one thing it does. Another thing it does, it removes pretty much all th- all ions. So if you've ever heard of distilled water, yeah. distilled water is when you basically uh, glorified boil a water and you capture the vapor off of it. Mm-hmm. So that also leaves all of the um, ions in, in the boiled water and all of the vapor is free of that. So it, it makes close to the same thing as distilled water. Um, and I'm going to say something that sounds absolutely stupid right now. No, sorry. no stupid questions. So our water, our water went off here once and I was parched and we didn't have any bottled water and it was the shop. Well, maybe the shops were open. I don't know. But I wasn't about to go walk into the shop in the middle of the night. So I went to my condenser dryer and I took out the water and I poured it into a glass and I had a sip and it tasted horrible. (laughs) And that makes sense. Okay. Um, okay. There is actually a lot of science that goes into the taste of water. Um, you can ask any of your water providers, Dasani, Aquafina, all of those guys. Um, nutrients are what make water taste good. So <laughs> and salt. And would so that have been distilled water in a way? If it's yeah. from a yeah, okay. I, I would assume it's close to it. Um, yeah. Obviously, mm-hmm. I don't know your setup, but it would be, <laughs> and it's not advisable to drink that on a regular basis. Obviously, you're not going to dive and drink it once, but like essentially. Um, your body kind of works the same way as, a, as the osmotic pressure works. So if you put in water that has no nutrients in it, so like pure RO water, it can actually start stripping away nutrients from your own body. <laughs> oh my God, that makes so and, much sense. Yeah. And I'm not saying like, you know, you drink it and you die. That's not yeah. how it works. It's like a long-term problem. So like if you're drinking distilled bit water every day, like that's not advisable. And I think on the carton, it says that as well. At least I hope so. Um, so yeah, that's that's why because it just it has nothing in it, so it will won't taste good because we're all mm. so prone to what we're used to, and what we're used to is having salt and nutrients in the water. You know, it it reminds me because I mean I know it's not quite the same, but distillation as a process. You know, if we're talking about whiskey or vodka or any of the other things that are you know effectively distilled alcohol, you know, you're taking something very similar to a beer mash. It's grains, it's water, you're boiling it, and then you're boiling it off so that what you're getting is the runnings of that condensation. So you're not getting all of the, the necessarily the flavor that's coming in from the grains and the sugars, you're getting the vapors. And yeah. with, even within those runnings, you know, you get first runnings, you get last runnings, you get mid runnings, and they'll normally kind of cut the tail ends of it and, and use the middle bits and blend and do all the things. But that's the reason why those kinds of spirits are so much more expensive is because you're getting only a tiny amount of distilled alcohol per volume of mash, you know, as compared to beer where you're getting, you know, a fairly good return on your, on your, on your water and grain investment, you know, um, it's man, that's so cool. But so it's, cool. It's, yeah. And sorry there, we'll go back. That was a bit of a tangent when you started talking about deionized and distilled water. So no back worries. to you, Chelsea. Go back <laughs> no on. Worries. So as you can imagine, reverse osmosis, is, like as soon as that became a thing, that was like, you know, everybody was going to reverse osmosis, which is great because, you know, you get a consistent water to start from. And, you know, I, I think all of us can say when we go to like your industrial beers, you're looking for consistency. You know, when I go to pick up that beer, I want it to taste the way I remember it tasting. If it's different, mm-hmm. I'd be like, oh, that's not what I was looking for. I mean, it's it might be good, but it's not what I wanted. 
Um, yeah. So that's what a lot of those, uh, you know, industrial brewers are looking for is they really want to hit the consistency and make those people that love their beer um, not be upset about it. So that's um, it, you know. And, yeah. and, you, and, you know, how it ties in, I guess, to, to the commercial side, but, I mean, commercial breweries, especially the big ones, you know, Guinnesses of the world and Pilsner Quells of the world, you know, their styles may have been developed around what the water profiles were at the time, but now they're using generally reverse osmosis and they're adding in the same salts because that is the only way to get a predictable uh, water profile. So it's not it's not the case that now the Guinness um, uh, storehouse and, the, and you know the Guinness breweries are just using the water from around. Absolutely not. It's just that the styles developed in and around the areas back then in the sixteen and seventeen hundreds. Yeah, that's yeah, a really and good probably point. back in the sixteen and seventeen hundreds, they wouldn't have any uh, like wastewater treatment plants or anything like that. So they just poured it like in Dublin, probably straight back into the Liffey. Probably. I mean, I, like I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And so, Tandy, tell me, when you're home brewing, mm. so w- going back to the s- sustainability and the seven to one ratio being the average yeah. on general. So where does the seven to one, is it just the cleaning afterwards or the priming right. of equipment or? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually glad you asked that because um, p- people, you, you know, there's that, um, you, you get like t-shirts and memes and shit that are like, uh, you know, save water, drink beer. And it's like, absolutely not. Like that is literally the opposite of what you could do if you wanted to <laughs> save water. Um, and, and the reason is that, you know, people are only, often they're only considering when they're thinking about that, they're thinking about the ratio of water to alcohol in big sarcastic air quotes like in a bottle and they're thinking oh well you know it's not as much water because there's other stuff in it but as you rightly said katie it's like cleaning your equipment beforehand you know you've got to heat your water with heating your water you have certain losses um, because it evaporates away and then when you're mashing you have certain losses when you're boiling you have certain losses so you have to account for it so you know if i'm brewing a like a homebrew, and I normally do about ah, 20, 22, 23 liters, some, sometimes it's closer to 19, depends on the day, but I'm often using about 40 liters just for the actual um, mash and sparge and boil, because a lot of it boils away. Then there is at least another 20 liters on cleaning, cleaning, sanitizing, and don't forget that that's just your equipment for making the beer and brewing, then you've got to think about bottles or cans or caps or whatever else is touching the beer because everything needs to be sterile. So with that, you need water and you need some sort of sterilizing solution and everything needs to be clean and everything needs to be tidy. So, you know, look, the the one thing that I could probably recommend is, you know, when I use a grain father, which a lot of people do use, but some people don't, but effectively when when you're cooling your, your beer down, you can do it in a couple of ways. And one of them is these counterflow chillers. So imagine imagine three pipes. Well, it's actually only two, but one is coming from the cold water. It's coming in and it's going opposite to the hot beer coming from where wherever you're, you're circulating. The hot beer in the pipe touches the cold water and through the circulation, it chills down and goes out the other end. So what you get is, cold beer and hot water okay so it's really two pipes but they're going in opposite directions anyway that's called a counterflow chiller you can do that either with a coil chiller or a general counterflow there's a number of different ways either which way what you're really doing then is pouring a lot of cold water in from a tap and out through a tap or out through a hose now the easiest way for you to try and save some of that water is to capture it for your cleaning. So that's the one thing I do is I capture my my runoff, you know, hot water, uh, which is actually really useful because when you clean, you want it not to be freezing cold. So capturing your, your hot water from your chilling process is really useful for cleaning. And sometimes you have too much of it. And a lot of people, depending on the country, depending on your lifestyle, all of that things, you know, you can capture it into buckets, use it in the garden. And um, in South Africa, I used to run it almost straight into the swimming pool because I had a pool there. And so that was great. <laughs> you know, you just like fill the pool. Um, but you you can do a lot of things with that water. And I think there's 
there are ways to save, um, you know, on, on the waste, because it is a lot. It really is a lot. And bottling and cleaning is an enormous amount of water. There's no getting around it. Yeah, I feel like I feel like I'd love if I had a swimming pool here, but we are. Reco- I don't know when this is when this episode is going to air, but we're stuck in a storm sandwich between Dudley and Eunice at the moment. Very, very stormy names. Am I right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> we're in the most old-fashioned like hurricanes ever. <laughs> oh, I know, yeah. but um, yeah, I, there's no chance of us having a pool here. But in industry, Chelsea, how do they deal with with all of the wastewater, and how what do they do with that? Yeah, so um, they reuse it just just like Tandy said. Um, she's doing what she can with her her home system. They reuse it as much as they can, and. It's actually interesting. Um, I was reading up on a couple couple of, um, as I was reading up on the treatment technologies, I was starting to see the story of how they developed into this recycling. And it was driven not only from an environmentally conscious um, decision, but actually a cost as well. Yeah. So, um, you know, recycling water can save a lot, like, because you're, you don't have to pay for the water to come in. You don't have to pay for the discharge or the treatment that's required. Um, um, on the on the the way out, and one thing that a lot of people miss as well is the energy usage. So um, one thing breweries are really good at is recapturing the heat, um, because um, like uh, I think I mentioned water use efficiency before. A lot of industrial processes also use energy use efficiency. So they track those two metrics when it comes to sustainability. And what they're finding is that there's always a trade-off. So usually if you're using more energy, which means your energy use efficiency goes down, then you save on water and vice versa. So it's always like a give and take between energy and water. Um, So when you save water, you save energy as well. So Mm. So um, I suppose if your energy is is renewable energy that you might be generating from a solar panel or something, then it's okay to use that energy, maybe. It's a better yeah, trade-off. It's, it's a better trade-off because you don't have a higher impact as if you're using oil and gas yeah. and you're it's a high water user. So your actual water footprint is high because your energy uses is high. Whereas if you use solar, then the water input is nothing and therefore... Mm. Well, there's a little bit in the manufacturing of the stuff, but it's much lower than oil and gas. So, um, yeah, so there, there's that aspect as well. So, like, all of those advanced treatment techniques l- leaned into on the front end. So, bringing the water in, you want it to be blank slate. Then they started treating the back end. So, they started, um, and for anybody that's brewed, and you see what the waste looks like after. And when I started brewing, and I started looking at the numbers as a traditional water and wastewater person, I was like, what? Um, the, the values are very high. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there. There's microbiology. Um, but that actually makes it fun to treat because you've got a lot of bio- biological activity to help treat the water because wastewater treatment, um, even using like the traditional sense of wastewater treatment, is all mostly biological. So what they've actually done is there's membrane membrane bioreactors that are used to treat that water. Um, so it's essentially they they it's like a fixed film. So they grow bugs on the membrane and it treats while also filtering. So yeah, it's quite interesting. That's so very, cool. Yeah, it's very innovative. Um, and I was actually reading up, and this is the first time I've heard about it, and I nerded out the other day, just getting into the weeds on this one, um, but there are a couple of brewing companies in California, Bear Brewing Company and Lagunitas, that are using um, electrically um, electric uh, CO2 biogas recovery. So what that means is they're using the membrane bioreactor and then capturing the CO2 that gets off gas. So as, as the bugs eat stuff, they release CO2 into the atmosphere. So they capture that and they make biogas out of it. So they're kind of doing that whole water, energy, nexus, all the buzzwords with sustainability. They're like, they're in it. And I found That's that quite so interesting. Cool. That's yeah. great. And I actually read a really good article about um, bear brewing. I think um, yeah. uh, from Good Beer, Good Beer Hunting, but we'll link in the show notes that goes into their their water treatment and how they have reduced their beer to water water to beer ratio. I'm going to get it right. <laughs> beer to, 
And um, I think that would be a really nice thing to see on the on a bottle. Like you have your ABV yes. and yeah. some of the breweries now are putting like what hops and what 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 grain they're using in it. And it would be really nice to see what is or even if for to publish on the website or like mm. on a yearly basis. What, yeah. what is our water to beer ratio? That would yeah, because be- I think beer beer brewing was able to get down to like two point three or something like that. It was crazy low, like compared wow. to you know the average. So and that and that I guess is calculated including the reuse and the and the recycling yeah. and the everything of it. So so it it almost captures the makeup. It's not just you know what you're using; it's how you're reusing and all of that. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah, yeah, and, and they also had like a heat recovery system as well. So like obviously mm. boiling stuff, you're going to have heat all over the place. So just like you were saying with your coil, mm. like reusing that wherever you can, like it, it saves water, it saves energy and it's good for the it's, environment. So It's effectively free hot water. I mean, free is, is, is a loose term, but like it's free hot water and you want hot water for what a million things. Why not use it? It's yeah. just, you know, the only, the only downside is not even a real downside, but the only downside is just the kind of the physical labor of needing to cha- change the buckets and make sure that you've got enough. And, you know, it's all of that sort of stuff because it does get heavy. You know, water is, um, if you're carrying a 20 or 30 liter bucket, it's, it's you know, 30 kilos plus the bucket weight. So it's like, it's a lot, but hey, we're strong people. Let's do it. Yeah. And, it's worth and especially it. like on, on um, if, if you're home brewing and you have an RO system, you know, a lot of those RO systems, it's like 20% is waste, you know? So whatever mm. you're getting in, you're only getting 80% coming out of the RO. So that waste stream, throw it on your garden. It's full of nutrients. Like, like I was saying before, RO is all about taking out the nutrients. So throw that on your garden and use it to so you know, you grow the stubborn plants. Put it on your plants and they're going to flourish because they have all yeah. these nutrients. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. To know. So, yeah. yeah, or use it to clean your bottles or whatever it is. Um, yeah, so there's yeah. there's lots of uses for it. I think, Tandy, you, it sounds like you've got a good system. I need to work on that, sadly. It's a very rudimentary engineer. system. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still doing the, the bag and pot thing, so... Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> no, I I mean there's always there's always ways to try and not waste as much as you're going to waste, but there is always a cost to it, you know. And and as you said, there is an energy cost, there's a water cost. There's and you know for big brewers there's a very big like yeast cost. That's why yeast um harvesting is a really big thing because yeast is really expensive for what it is. I mean, for how little you get for it, it's very very expensive. So people you know, people, whether it's a home brewer, whether it's an industrial brewer, will always try and find ways to shave costs and to reuse things and to also aim for better consistency, which, you know, really, if quality is driving it, all for it. Oh, and and like even maintaining your yeast. I've heard of people that um, go away on holiday and they like rent a sitter for their sourdough starter. And <laughs> <laughs> love it. I love it. <laughs> I also love it. I mean, you know, these are like living organisms that give us stuff. Let's just, you know. It's mind cool. them. Yeah, <laughs> that is cool. <laughs> what, what we sneakily did there that people, I don't know if they realize or not, but we are all on our second beers. Mm. And I know Chelsea is on her own homebrew. So tell us about it. Yeah, it's an imperial stout. Um, yeah, it was very ambitious. Um, I think I made one of the um, first time brewer mistakes of you know, oh, I really like that type of beer. So I'm going to try and brew it. And I <laughs> literally am in like a one bedroom and have a stove and a posh. And um, it ended up taking like two batches. And I even have some of the grain left over because I just, I couldn't do it in my my sad setup. Um, but yeah, so I made an Imperial Stout. It's supposed to be Imperial Stout. I like it. It's really good. The first time I opened it, I so I had to condition it in the bottle for six months. Um, and I used, I used just normal sugar because I've never really bought the beer sugar. Um, I, I don't know why I just, it, it was you can one of those things. Sugar anyway. <laughs> yeah. And it was one of those things, like when I was researching, nobody was like, oh, don't forget to get the sugar. So I was just like, oh, you can use normal sugar. And then I was reading that there was beer sugar and I didn't know. So I was just like, sugar's fine. Um, but yeah, anyways. Uh, so yeah, I, uh, six months, the first time I opened it, not super happy about it. It was really sweet. But it's been about a month. It's much better now, I'd say. I don't know, Tandy, if you want to talk about that, but I don't know why, but it's it's much better after a month. <laughs> it's it's weird because when, when you age beer, it, and it depends on the style of beer. So some styles 
like Imperial Stouts, a lot of the flavors will be really, really intense and sharp at first, and then they'll mellow out. So it, uh, it it's weird to me that it's less sweet, but it, it does make sense that it's more drinkable, I guess, um, because because if you age an IPA, for instance, like the first the first time you drink the IPA when like when it's really fresh, it's going to be super bitter, super hoppy. It's going to be all the things. And then it starts to like dull and age and it gets almost a little bit sweeter. It doesn't get sweeter. It's just that the bitterness fades a little bit. But with an imperial start, like those flavors, they just, they're, it's one of those things that the longer you can age it for, it's almost the better. Um, yeah. Ah, absolutely. It, it also could be cool. my bottle control because uh, oh, I think I was, I just like mixed up the thing and oh, yeah. God. Listen. Might have just been a bad bottle. But you you did it, Chelsea. Well done. And you're drinking it and you haven't died. So it's true. Well done. Like, I think it was something like a 12 hour beer day or brew day. Like, that was, yeah, it was intense because I was also learning because that was my first grain bill as well. I had Mm. only done the extracts before that. So Mm I I was just like, oh, I'll brew one of my favorite beers and it'll be ready for Christmas. It'll be perfect. Same Don't do it your words. first time. That's all I have to say. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. But I think it's really cool that you did that. And why the hell not? I mean, Jeepers, the other day I was trying to um I was trying to bottle. I've made a I've made a Saison recently because I always seem to brew Saisons. But anyway, and I and I realized that to clean my bottles. I just didn't have the right solution and they'd been sitting under my stairs and they'd been a little dirtier than they should have been. It's not, irre- you know, it's not irrecoverable, but they were dirtier. So then I was on all the bottle brushes in the world trying to like figure out what the hell's going on. And now I've got this really long bottle brush, but it's got this like thing at the end, which all it does is scratch the bottom. So it doesn't clean. So I was like, damn it. So then I went to Woody's and I bought other bottle brushes and one has got like spongy bits at the bottom. I was like, awesome, this is going to work. It wasn't long enough. So then I, I, I got another one, which is like a bamboo bristles, all the things. And then it was too wide to fit into the bottleneck. And I was like, oh, this is ridiculous. This is like, these are stupid problems. So uh, genuinely stupid problems, but I really did need to bottle my beer that day. <laughs> so my poor husband, God bless him. He, manipulated some of the bottle brushes he took he took the things away that made them too short so like the, it's actually the base that made them too short took that away attached it and and shaved it down into a drill bit and then had the drill on it and then that's, <gasps> that's the right. way we clean bottles which wow. was wow hmm? yeah so right. that was actually pretty cool and um back to the water thing i managed to not use loads and loads of running water while washing bottles because I had a big old Tupperware and everything was soaking in there. So we could like kind of drill bit wash them in this big tub of this cleaning water. And look, you can reuse cleaning water in other ways, but to be honest, I didn't that time. I was very you, <laughs> you were going to have to like patent that drill bit cleaner thing. You get them. You actually oh, do can get, you them get them from them? brew stores. Yeah, you get them. And um, I just, because I was, you know, I'm always last minute.com for everything. I hadn't thought about that properly. So now okay. we've got our own homemade one. Why not? I like it. Well, I've got one of Great. those like pumpy things. Oh, like... I've got one of those too, but I use it for my sanitizer. Oh, okay. Mm. Are you supposed mm. to separate those? Oh gosh, we might need to have a conversation after this. It's fine. We can have a conversation. <laughs> Quality well, control might not be the best. <laughs> well, on that note, we might go and have a conversation and uh, we might uh, leave you for this session. We've been talking about uh, water. I want to say thank you so much, Chelsea, for coming and talking to you. It's always a pleasure. We love chatting to you. And I'm so glad we finally got you on the podcast after, I don't know, badgering you for two <laughs> years, how, year. however long we've been doing this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> oh no problem it's yeah we, we were pleasure. never going to do water without chelsea being on it so you know that's just it. <laughs> <laughs> no it's been such a pleasure and i really appreciate you guys asking me to be on i watch your guys' stuff all the time and i'm learning day by day so uh, yeah thanks for asking we're all learning we're all le- i'm definitely learning because uh like i'll leave it to the experts like tandy <laughs> and the history people and- so on that note it's going to be a goodbye from us Bye. Bye, everybody. I'm going to say you can uh, catch us, as always, on Twitter, 
on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube. We're at, at Beer Ladies Pod. Apart from YouTube, we're YouTube forward slash Beer Ladies Podcast. Mm. Um, you can also buy us a coffee at Beer Lady buy us a coffee for slash beer ladies podcast um and of course we will put that money to very good use if you would like to sponsor us and and get more amazing content like this (laughs) Uh, (laughs) so please like share subscribe and tell all your friends about this if you're out par walking in the evening you know listen to your podcast just tune in tune in and join us okay so bye. bye bye